It must be one of the greatest pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Professor Surata Bosch. Uh, Professor Bosch, uh, who is one of the distinguished historians of the world in our time, obviously comes uh, from one of the distinguished family of India. He is the grand nephew of Subhash Chandra Bosch. Professor Bosch, greater half, uh, Professor Aya Sajalal, who is also one of the finest historians of our time, is also the grand niece of Sadat Hassan Mantu. So what a celebration, and we are so lucky to have Professor Bose with us today. It is also an honor for me to formally introduce him. I'm sure many of you have read about his work, you are familiar with him, and in 2017, when he spoke here, many of you could listen to him. Professor Bose is Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard. He served as the Director of Graduate Studies in History at Harvard and as the founding director of Harvard's South Asia Institute. Prior to taking up Gardiner Say at Harvard University in 2001, Professor Bose was a fellow at St. Catherine College, University of Cambridge. And he also served as a professor of history and diplomacy at Taft University. Bose was educated at Presidency College, Calcutta the University of Cambridge, where he obtained his PhD. His scholarship has contributed to a deeper understanding of colonial, post-colonial political economy, relation between rural and urban domains, the life of Indian politics, and many other issues. His list of publications is really long. I would not like to burden you with those names. I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work. However, uh, two of his last talk, uh, His Majesty's opponent, Suhas Chandra Bose and India's Struggle Against Empire, uh, which was first published in 2011, and the very recent one, The Nation as Mother and Other Visions of Nationhood, are really critical for our contemporary political understanding. He was a recipient of uh, several fellowships, including Gagenbaum Fellowship, and gave the one of the most prestigious uh, talk at the University of Cambridge GM Trevelyan Lecture. In 2015, Professor Bose was awarded Rabindra Broska, the highest literary award in literary award from Bengal. Bose is the joint editor with Cecil Kumar Bose of the 12th volume collected works of Netaji Suhasandra Bose and joint editor with Krishna Bose of Purobi, the East in its Feminine Gender, a book of translation of Saroj Choudhury of Rabindranath Tagore's poem on Charles. He has translated into English Tagore, the War Voyager, and published recordings of Bengali songs too, including Amar Rabindranath or My, My Tagore in 2010. He has also made several documentary films on modern South Asian history and politics that have been the broadcast on the public television in both USA and India. He is the director of Netaji Research Bureau in Calcutta. But more importantly, Professor Bose served as a member of parliament in India, elected in 16th Lok Sabha, 2014 and 19, and I'm sure all of us were privileged to listen to his some of the most inspiring talks uh, on our television screens. His eloquent speeches in Parliament were widely heard and appreciated, and we are really grateful for his parliamentary politics. I now invite Professor Bose to give the keynote to this for this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Gopi, uh, for your generous introduction. I hope uh, all of you realize uh, how fortunate you are to have a historian of the caliber of Arupjyoti Sakya teaching you at this uh, Institute of Technology. I would also uh, like to thank uh, Professor Akshana Borua, uh, Professor uh, Rohini Mokashi Punekar, and Professor Jha for putting together this colloquium. Uh, Rohini, in particular, is a very fine correspondent, and uh, she has made sure that I am uh, standing uh, before you uh, here today. The whole assembly rose to their feet. Mahatma Gandhi wrote, 
describing the burning of Asiatic registration certificates in the grounds of the Hamidia Mosque in Johannesburg on August 16, 1908, and made the place resound with the echoes of their continuous cheers during the burning process. I took this photograph uh, on a visit a few years ago to Johannesburg. They still have the urns in which the certificates were burned. And on it now, of course, they have put uh, this inscription, Truth. The contest between the truth of the Satyagrahi against the power of colonial and post-colonial states played out at key moments of Gandhian resistance from passive resistance in South Africa in the early 20th century to Gandhi's final fast in January 1948 to defend the rights of minorities. Gandhi's transcending of religious difference was crafted in his conception of passive resistance or satyagraha from late 1906 to 1914 in South Africa. The provocation had come in the form of an Asiatic registration ordinance issued by the Transvaal government, which would have required all Asiatics in that territory to register and carry certificates bearing their fingerprints. Gandhi gave a call to Indians to take a pledge not to submit to this compulsory registration. At a mass meeting in September 1906, 3,000 Hindus, Muslims and Christians took an oath to go to jail rather than register in this fashion. The organizational backbone for this popular mobilization was supplied by the Hamidiya Islamic Society, a Muslim charitable organization formed in Johannesburg in July 1906. Undeterred by the Indian opposition, the Transvaal government introduced the ordinance in barely modified form as a bill in early 1907. The Satyagraha campaign against it began in earnest in April. A nominal prize was offered through the paper Indian Opinion for an Indian name for the movement that could go beyond the inadequacies of the English phrase passive resistance. Maganlal Gandhi won the prize by coining the word Sadagraha, Sat Agraha, Sadagraha, firm resolve. But his more famous namesake, Mohandas, changed it to the grammatically incorrect but more appealing Satyagraha to make it clearer. Gandhi invoked the blessings of Khuda Ishwar, the hyphenated form of common terms for God among Hindus and Muslims in support of the movement. The anti-registration drive proved to be remarkably successful. The natural consequences of such legislation, Gandhi had warned, would be segregation in locations and finally expulsion from the country. On November 30th, 1907, the deadline for registration, only 511 out of some 13,000 Asiatics had submitted to compulsory registration. The way in which Gandhi's paper, Indian Opinion, reported on the arrests gives some insight into his strategy of forging unity based on a healthy respect for cultural differences. In an attempt to show how people of diverse religious, regional, linguistic and caste backgrounds supported the movement, a typical update on arrests stated as follows. Four Surati Mohammedans, one Maiman Mohammedan, two Pathans, three Madrasis, three Banias, one Lohana, one Brahmin, two Desais, one Calcutta, one Parsi, one Punjabi and three Chinese. On December 28, 1907, Gandhi himself was imprisoned for the first time. Gandhi's reading habits in jail reflected the political philosophy that underpinned unity among religious faiths in the movement. He read the Gita at dawn, the Quran at noon, and used the Bible to give lessons to a fellow Christian convict. Negotiations with General Smuts conducted from jail eventually resulted in Gandhi, 
the Chinese leader Liu Qin and Kambi Naidu accepting a settlement by which they agreed to voluntary registration in return for a subsequent repeal of the law. Smuts did not repeal the Registration Act. Stunned by the breach of faith, the Transvaal Indians gathered on the grounds of the Hamidiyah Mosque in Johannesburg on August 16, 1908 and burned some 2,000 registration certificates. Five years later, the Indian Immigrants Bill of 1913, embodying various restrictions on domicile and interprovincial migration, triggered the renewal of the Satyagraha campaign. The lead was taken in May 1913 by the British Indian Association of the Transvaal, whose president, Ahmed Muhammad Kachalia, worked closely with Gandhi in launching the movement. By June 1913, Gandhi made up his mind to take up the cause of the indentured workers in Natal and included the repeal of a very regressive three-pound tax in his charter of demands. The Gandhi instituted the Solomon Commission of Enquiry to look into the causes of the Natal strike and Satyagraha. The recommendations of the Commission presented to the Union Parliament in March 1914 formed the basis of the Indians Relief Act of July 1914. The repeal of the three pound tax of 1895 through this law was the crowning achievement of the Satyagraha campaign. Despite some shortcomings, Gandhi felt that the Indian Reliefs Act, Indians Relief Act of 1914 signified a successful conclusion to the passive resistance struggle which commenced in September 1906 and constituted the Magna Carta of our liberty in this land. Gandhi brought back from South Africa not just techniques of struggle, but an approach to the crafting of Indian unity that was respectful of internal cultural differences and yes, yet was able to transcend them. He deployed the, this approach with great effect in achieving Hindu-Muslim unity in the Khilafat and non-cooperation movement of 1919 to 1922, the first all India mass movement against the British under Gandhi's leadership. In 1919, Gandhi launched the first all India Satyagraha against what he called lawless laws being enacted by a satanic government. The raw attack turned wartime ordinances into peacetime legislation, enabling the British to hold Indians in prison on mere suspicion of being terrorists, without charge and without trial for a period of two years. A hundred years on, the Rollert Act is back with a vengeance in the form of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act amended by the current regime in July 2019. What a 100th anniversary gift to the nation. Gandhi launched his journal, Young India, in which he excoriated the colonial state for trying to give acts of violence by the state the veneer of legality. Defending his compatriots, Shokat and Muhammad Ali, he wrote, for has not the sepoy been used to hold India under subjection? Has he not been used to murder innocent people in, at Jallianwala Bar? Has he not been used to drive away innocent men, women and children during that dreadful night at Shantpur? Has he not been used to subjugate the proud Arab of Mesopotamia? Has he not been utilized to crush the Egyptian? How can any Indian having a spark of humanity in him and any Muslim having any pride in his religion feel otherwise than as the Ali brothers have done. The sepoy has been used more often as a hired assassin than as a soldier defending the liberty or the honor of the weak and the helpless. This was one of the articles for which Gandhi was tried for sedition in March 1922. Gandhi declared in his own defense, section 124a under which I am happily charged, is perhaps the prince among the political sections of the Indian Penal Code designed to suppress the liberty of the citizen. 
Affection cannot be manufactured or regulated by law. I hold it to be a virtue to be disaffected towards a government which in its totality has done more harm to India than any previous system. Holding such a belief, I consider it to be a sin to have affection for the system. And it has been a precious privilege for me to be able to write what I have in the various articles tendered in evidence against me. Sadly, this lawless law that had been used by the British to persecute our freedom fighters is still on our statute books. I had asked for this law to be repealed in a speech in Parliament uh, just after the Rohit Bebula suicide and uh, the troubles that were taking place at JNU at that time. Students raising the cry for freedom have been charged with sedition under this law and assaulted by black-coated stormtroopers inside court premises. Urged by C.F. Andrews to publicly clarify his position on the Khilafat, Gandhi wrote in Young India on 21st July 1920, I should clear the ground by stating that I reject any religious doctrine that does not appeal to reason and is in conflict with morality. I tolerate unreasonable religious sentiment when it is not immoral. I hold the Khilafat claim to be both just and reasonable, and therefore it derives greater force because it has behind it the religious sentiment of the Muslim world. Gandhi could conceive the possibility of a blind and fanatical religious sentiment existing in opposition to pure justice. Under those circumstances, he would resist the former and fight for the latter. But since the Indian Muslims had an issue that was first of all reasonable and just, and on top of that supported by scriptural authority, then for the Hindus not to support them to be utmost would be a cowardly breach of brotherhood. Gandhi could not have been more forthright in acknowledging the extraterritorial nature of the Muslim sentiment. Let Hindus not be frightened by pan-Islamism. It is not, it need not be, anti-Hindian or anti-Hindu. Closer to home, Gandhi and Shwakat Ali decided to formulate three national slogans. Allahu Akbar, Bande Mataram or Bharat Mata Ki Jai, and Hindu Musalman Ki Jai. Gandhi called upon all Hindus and Muslims to join in the first cry in reverence and prayerfulness, since Hindus may not fight shy of Arabic words when their meaning is not only totally inoffensive but even ennobling. He preferred Bande Mataram to Bharat Mata Ki Jai as, and I quote him, these are his words, not mine, as it would be a graceful recognition of the intellectual and emotional superiority of Bengal, unquote. And since India was nothing without the union of the Hindu and the Muslim heart, Hindu Musalman Ki Jai was a cry never to be forgotten. Two decades later, Mahatma Gandhi drafted a historic resolution in April 1942 calling upon the British to quit India. He indicated in interviews that he would be, quote, prepared to take the risk of violence to end the great calamity of slavery, unquote. The ordered anarchy that he saw around him, he felt, was worse than real anarchy. A somewhat watered-down version of Gandhi's Quit India Resolution was eventually adopted by the Congress in August 1942. The Mahatma called upon Indians to do or die in the struggle for freedom. On August 9, 2017, a special debate was held in the Indian Parliament on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Quit India movement. Prime Minister Narendra Modi grandly announced that the five years from 2017 to 2022 would replicate 
the extraordinary journey of 1942 to 1947 from Sankalp to Siddhi, from resolution to realization. I took part in that debate and offered a different interpretation of the journey in the 1940s and an alternative vision of India in the 2020s. I pointed out that Jawaharlal Nehru's famous Tryst with Destiny speech in mid-August 1947 began with an honest confession. The Pledge of Freedom was being redeemed not wholly or in full measure. The Pledge of Freedom was being realized according to Nehru very substantially, but that was questionable if one reflected for a moment on the hefty human toll being taken by the tragedy of partition. Nehru made moving references to the architect of India's freedom. We have often been unworthy followers of his, he acknowledged, and have strayed from his message. The Mahatma's silence spoke louder than Nehru's eloquence. Between 1945 and January 1948, Gandhian truth stood up to the unholy compromises and political expediency of late colonial and post-colonial state power. Just as the Quit India movement was being crushed, a great patriotic fervor had gripped Indians in Southeast Asia and Northeast India under the dynamic leadership of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. On October 21st, 1943, Netaji proclaimed the formation of the Azad Hind government in Singapore. In the final paragraph came the exhortation to the Indian people. In the name of God, in the name of bygone generations who have welded the Indian people into one nation, and in the name of the dead heroes who have bequeathed to us a tradition of heroism and self-sacrifice, we call upon the Indian people to rally round our banner and strike for India's freedom. The provisional government is entitled to and hereby claims, the proclamation said in an echo of its Irish predecessor, the allegiance of every Indian. It guarantees religious liberty as well as equal rights and equal opportunities to its, to its citizens. Equal rights and equal opportunities to its citizens. It declares its firm resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation equally. The happiness and prosperity of the whole nation equally and transcending all the differences cunningly fostered by an alien government in the past. In this sentence, equal or equally figures three times. He appealed to the Mahatma in a broadcast from Rangoon on July 6, 1944. Father of our nation, in this holy war, we ask for your blessings and good wishes. Gandhiji's charkha continued to adorn the center of the tricolor flags that INA soldiers carried around Imphal and Kohima in their march towards Delhi. The scale of Netaji's success in forging Hindu-Muslim unity at a time when divisions along lines of religion were looming large within India cannot be exaggerated. Netaji forged an innovative path to a cosmopolitan anti-colonialism among expatriate patriots by nurturing a process of cultural intimacy among India's diverse communities. Once the trial began at the Red Fort of the INA officers, Prem Kumar Sagal, Urbak Singh Hillan, and Shanawas Khan in November 1945, political parties and religious communities united in a popular movement against the hubris of the British Raj. On December 17, 1945, in Kolkata, Gandhi paid homage to his rebellious son Shuhash in the bedroom of the Elgin Road home from where he had made his great escape in 1941. Gandhi was in Medinipur on Jul January 3rd, 1946, when news came that the Red Fort Three, who had been sentenced to deportation for life on December 31st, 1945, had been released. 
These Hindu, Muslim and Sikh soldiers of freedom came from the Punjab. But the INA had undermined the British separation of martial and non-martial races and had large numbers of Tamils and South Indians in its ranks. Gandhi urged INA soldiers he met in Madras to follow the lead of the Congress. On February 10, 1946, he decided to revive his journal, Harijan, after a gap of three and a half years. One of his first articles published on February 12th addressed the question of unity. Netaji's name, Gandhi wrote, is one to conjure with. His patriotism is second to none. His bravery shines through all his actions. The lesson that Netaji and his army brings to us is one of self-sacrifice, unity irrespective of class and community, and discipline. On his return to Delhi in early April 1946, Gandhi visited INA prisoners in the Kabul lines and the Red Fort. He was told that they had never felt any distinction of creed or religion in the INA. But here we are faced with Hindu tea and Muslim tea being served by their British captors, they complained. Why do you suffer it? Gandhi asked. No, we don't, they said. We mix Hindu tea and Muslim tea exactly half and half and then serve. The same with food. That is very good, exclaimed Gandhi, laughing. At the height of the non-cooperation and Khilafat movement in the early 1920s, Gandhi had not dined together with even his closest political comrades, Shokat and Muhammad Ali. Eating, he had said, was one of the privately performed sanitary practices of life, and the Ali brothers were indulgent of his bigotry if his self-denial could be so named. On the matter of interdining, he had happily changed with the times. He was nostalgic about the euphoria of the common political struggle a quarter of a century ago. The Ali brothers and I used to go all over the country together like blood brothers, he recalled on April 6, 1946. We spoke with one voice and we delivered the message of Hindu-Muslim unity and Swaraj to the masses. Aurukchuthi just reminded me as we were having coffee outside that Gandhiji made his first visit to Assam, to Gohati uh, at that time. The climax of the joint movement had been reached in Delhi, where Swami Shraddhanam addressed a gigantic gathering of Hindus and Muslims in the Jama Masjid. It was a glorious day in India's history, Gandhi declared, the memory of which we shall always treasure. Gandhi knew that the Muslim masses, by and large, had not been as enthused by his civil disobedience and quit India movements of the early 1930s and 1942, excepting in the Northwest Frontier Province. The remembrance of the early 1920s Satyagraha and the example of the INA between 1943 and 1945 became recurring features of his discourses on unity. The Mahatma was in Delhi to hold talks with the cabinet mission that had recently arrived in India. By the spring of 1946, the, British could, the question was not anymore whether the British could be forced to quit India, but rather how power was to be distributed among communities and regions upon the British withdrawal. Gandhiji's relevance to the Congress as a leader of mass movements unfortunately diminished as soon as it was clear that the colonial masters had read the writing on the wall and were preparing to leave. However, he had not yet been completely elbowed aside. He was present at Simla in early May during the tripartite talks between the British, the Congress and the League to try and reach a constitutional settlement. You have achieved a complete unity among the Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, Christians, Anglo-Indians and Sikhs in your ranks, Gandhi told 60 INA officers who came to see him in Simla. That was no mean achievement outside India and he urged them to keep that spirit of unity alive under Indian conditions. Unity, however, eluded the Congress and the Muslim League leaders who had gathered at Simla, and the talks broke down 
on 12th May 1946. The cabinet mission was then left with no option but to issue a statement on 16th May based on the lowest common denominator of the Congress and League positions, proposing a three-tiered federal constitutional structure based on three groups of provinces. After a careful perusal of the 16th May statement, Gandhi rose above the usual nationalist suspicion of British perfidy, of which there was plenty, to give a measured opinion on 20th May. It was, according to him, the best document that the British would have produced under the circumstances. The possible, possible infringement of provincial autonomy by the groups posed a potential problem. For example, could the Northwest Frontier Province be bundled into Group B, dominated by Punjab, or Assam into Group C, against their will? In Gandhi's interpretation, the provinces were free to join groups on terms attractive to them and were not being forced to do so. His message to those worried by the grouping proposal and arbitrary assignment to groups was that there was not the slightest cause for perturbation. Grouping of provinces in the Muslim majority, sections B and C, was of the essence for the All India Muslim League which had given up the demand for a fully sovereign Pakistan on that assurance. Even though the League and the Congress formally accepted the cabinet mission proposal in June, Jawaharlal Nehru's statement on July 11, 1946, after taking over from Maulana Azad as Congress president, that grouping may not last, unnerved the League. With Jinnah calling for direct action to achieve the League's demand for Pakistan, Calcutta exploded in violence on August 16, 1946, and sporadic killings gripped Bombay in September. When will this orgy of madness end? Gandhiji asked in anguish on his 77th birthday on 2nd October 1946. Killings in Calcutta and stabbings in Dhaka, Agra, Ahmedabad and Bombay. Tego's song, Jibon Jakhon Shukai Jai, Puruna Dharai Esho, had never sounded more poignant. When life is parched up, come with a shower of mercy. Days later, in an article titled Hindu Pani and Muslim Pani, Gandhi wrote, a stranger traveling in Indian trains may well have a painful shock when he hears at railway stations for the first time in his life ridiculous sounds about Pani, tea, and the like being either Hindu or Muslim. Even as late as September 1946, Gandhi had believed that the violence was lodged in the hearts of a handful of townspeople and that as a villager he was one with the ocean of Indian humanity. The eruption of violence in the rural backwaters of Noakhali in the second week of October 1946 came as a rude shock ensuring that the Bengal countryside became the venue of one of his most challenging experiments with truth. Even before he could reach Bengal, however, terrible violence was unleashed on the Muslim minority in Bihar. Is it nationalism, Gandhi asked in indignation, to seek barbarously to crush the 14% of the Muslims in Bihar? He did not, however, interrupt his journey to Noakhali. The apostle of non-violence was destined to follow the trail of violence, putting out the embers after the fires had done their destruction and supplying a healing touch to those who had been singed by its flames. On his arrival in East Bengal, Gandhi fondly remembered his first visit to the region in the company of the Ali brothers during the non-cooperation movement. This time he had come not as a congressman, but as a servant of God. He told the beleaguered Hindu minority that the Muslims were blood of our blood and bone of our bone. He sought complete identification with the people. I claim to be an Indian, he asserted, and therefore a Bengali, even as I am a Gujarati. Once he settled down to live in the village of Sri Rampur from November 20th, 1946, he diligently took lessons in Bengali 
and he said that Bengal had produced not just Tagore and Bumkin, but also, as he put it, and this is important, the heroes of the Chittagong Armory raid, however misguided their action might have been in my eyes. Based in remote Noakhali, Gandhi consistently argued in favor of provincial rights. He admitted that Shubhash Bose had been right in contending in 1939 that Assam was a special case and that the Gopinath Bordoloi ministry should not resign along with the other provincial governments. We look to the Congress, Gandhi pointed out, and then we feel that if we do not follow it slavishly, something will go wrong with it. I have said that not only a province, but even an individual can rebel against the Congress and by doing so, save it. The Mahatma had come a long way from imposing the discipline of the high command on provincial units. It was incumbent on the Congress and the League, according to him, to make their policy appeal to the reason of the recalcitrant province or groups. Between January 7th and March 2nd, 1947, Mahatma Gandhi undertook a 116-mile pilgrimage on foot through 47 villages of Noakhali and Tipera. Manu Gandhi sang his favorite hymn, Vaishnava Janato, at the early morning prayers on the day he set out on his journey. And I must congratulate the students for performing that song so beautifully and also uh, the other Sufi songs that were performed. It truly created the atmosphere for today's proceedings. At Bapu's suggestion, the word Vaishnava would occasionally be replaced with Muslim and Isahi during the singing of the chorus lines. On January 20th, he reached the village of Shirandi where Amtus Salam was on the 24th day of a fast for the cause of Hindu-Muslim unity. At Dolta, on January 23rd, the Chaudhuris of the village gifted him the plot of land on which his prayer meeting was held. He was glad that on the auspicious birthday of Netaji Shubhashchandra Bose, he had received this gift and had the privilege of staying at the home of a scheduled caste friend, Rai Mohan Mali. He reminded his audience that Netaji was an Indian first and last, and that he fired all under him with the same zeal, so that they forgot in his presence all distinctions and acted as one man. Shubhash, Gandhiji said, had in his life verified the saying of Tulsidas, that all becomes right for the brave. The next day at Muraim, Gandhiji stayed in the house of Habibullah Patwari and addressed the largest gathering of his tour. In Komalapur in Tipera on February 21st, Gandhi was asked point blank whether he, who had been advocating inter-caste marriages, also favoured inter-religious marriages. He honestly answered that there was a time when he had not done so, but had quite a while ago decided that an inter-religious marriage was a welcome event whenever it took place. It had to be based on mutual friendship, either party having equal respect for the religion of the other. Gandhiji devoted the month of March 1947, serving those who had suffered grievously in Bihar. As he moved from Bengal to Bihar, he disdainfully rejected an urgent invitation to attend a Congress Working Committee meeting in Delhi, saying that was not within his present beat. On his arrival in Patna on March 5th, he stated categorically that what the Hindus of Bihar had done to the Muslims was infinitely worse than the horrors in Noakhali. Accompanied by Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, he visited ruined Muslim homes and asked Hindus to atone for their sins in the land of Tulsidas's Ram Charit Manas. No sooner than Gandhi had started to restore some calm in Bihar, the news came of the violence that had engulfed Punjab. Prime Minister Clement Attlee had announced on February 20th, 1947, that the British would quit India by June 1948 at the latest. The Hindu Mahasabha 
immediately demanded the partition of Punjab and Bengal. Jawaharlal Nehru followed suit. With Gandhi away in Bihar, the Congress Working Committee passed a momentous resolution on March 8, 1947, calling for the partition of Punjab. Nehru explained that the principle of partition might have to be extended to Bengal as well. At the very end of March, Gandhiji eventually came to Delhi and met Mountbatten. On April 1st, he told the delegates of the Asian Relations Conference being held in the Purana Kila that Indians did not know how to maintain peace. Speaking at the concluding session the next day, he expressed his embarrassment at the shameful carnage unfolding before their very eyes and begged the visitors from abroad not to not carry the memory of that carnage beyond the confines of India. Living among the Dalits of the city, Gandhiji preached the message of peace. His prayer services typically included Quranic verses along with excerpts from other religious scriptures. When one or two members of the audience objected to the recitation from the Quran, Gandhiji altogether refused to hold the prayers that day. He was prepared to cheerfully die with the name of Ram and Rahim on his lips. And as was pointed out by uh, Professor Akshana Borua, as a Sanatani Hindu, he claimed to be a Christian, a Buddhist, and a Muslim at the same time. Taking a stand against religious conservatives on all sides, he declared that he saw no reason why he should not read the Kalma, why he should not praise Allah, and why he should not acclaim Muhammad as the Prophet. Gandhi insisted that he had acted as a true Hindu in his efforts to befriend the Muslims. To his critics, he cited Iqbal's famous line, Mazhab nahi sikhata aapas mein bear rakhna. In both Noakhali and Bihar, his motto was do or die. My nonviolence, he explained, bids me dedicate myself to the service of the minorities. Between May 9th and May 14th, 1947, in Shodhpur, Gandhiji explored the possibility of keeping Bengal united in a series of interviews with Sharat Chandra Bose, Abul Hashim, and Hussein Shaheed Saravarti. Having heard that the plan of a united sovereign Bengal had received Gandhi's blessings, Shama Prashad Mukherjee rushed to Shodhpur on 13th May. Gandhi wanted Mukherjee to evaluate the scheme on its merits. An admission that Bengali Hindus and Bengali Muslims were one, Gandhi told the Mahasabha leader, would really be a severe blow against the two-nation theory of the League. When the Congress Working Committee met to ratify the 3rd June partition plan, Gandhi remonstrated with Nehru and Vallabhai Patel that they had not informed him of the partition scheme before committing themselves to it. With the exception of Gandhiji, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Jayaprakash Narayan, and Ram Manohar Lohia, no one else spoke a word against partition at that meeting. Gandhi's voice went unheeded since all his erstwhile yes-men had now turned into his no-men. Once August 15, 1947 was set as the date for independence, Gandhi expressed his desire to spend the day in Noakhali. He did, however, take a detour to Kashmir and Punjab in early August. At Srinagar, he made clear his view that the future of Kashmir, quote, should be decided by the will of the Kashmiris, unquote. On August 6th in Lahore, he told Congress workers that he was going to spend the rest of his life either in East Bengal or West Punjab or maybe the Northwest Frontier Province. Once he reached Bengal, he abandoned the plan of going to Noakhali on August 11th to work for the return of sanity to Calcutta. On August 13th, he moved into Hyderi Manzil, a Muslim home in the Belaghata neighborhood of Calcutta, ignoring the celebrations in New Delhi. 
Gandhiji chose to spend Independence Day fasting and praying with those who were poor and obscure. The Information and Broadcasting Department of the Government of India asked him for a message. The father of the nation simply said that he had run dry. Peace and Kamaradari reigned in Calcutta on August 15, 1947. In an editorial titled Miracle or Accident on August 16, Gandhiji narrated how Hindus were taken to masjids and Muslims to mandirs at the dawn of freedom. And both communities chanted Jai Hind in unison. It was neither miracle nor accident, but the willingness of human beings to dance to God's tune. We have drunk the poison of mutual hatred, Gandhiji wrote, and so this nectar of fraternization tastes all the sweeter, and the sweetness should never wear out. It was Eid on August 18, 1947. While Punjab descended into anarchy upon the announcement of Radcliffe's award the day before, Hindus and Muslims wished each other Eid Mubarak in Calcutta. During the non-cooperation movement, as I had mentioned, Gandhiji and Shaukat Ali had chosen three national slogans, Allahu Akbar, Bandi Mataram, and Hindu Musalman Ki Jai. Gandhiji was delighted that the last cry was being revived. As Bande Mataram was sung at the prayer meeting on August 29th, Hindus and Muslims on the stage and in the audience stood up to show their respect along with the rest of the audience. Uh, 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 the whole audience had stood up. Gandhiji alone remained seated because he believed standing up as a mark of respect for a national song was an unnecessary Western import and not a requirement of Indian culture. After Pakistan and India went to war over Kashmir, Gandhiji reiterated that the people of Kashmir must decide their own future, quote, without any coercion or show of it from within or without, unquote. Whispers had reached his ears that Kashmir could be divided along religious lines with Jammu for the Hindus and the Valley for the Muslims. He could not countenance such divided loyalties and splitting up of Indian states into so many parts. It was in such a grim domestic and international scenario that the first AICC session in post-independence India convened from November 15th to 17th. Addressing the AICC, Gandhiji spoke some home truths. No Muslim in the Indian Union, he told the leaders of the party and the government, should feel his life unsafe. During his post-prayer discourse on November 21st, he noted as many as 137 mosques in Delhi had been damaged, and he regarded all such desecration as a blot upon Hinduism. On January 12th, 1948, Mahatma Gandhi announced his momentous decision to start an indefinite fast to try and bring about a reunion of hearts among all communities. His reward would be regaining India's dwindling prestige and her fast fading sovereignty over the heart of Asia and there through the world. As he commenced his fast, when I survey the wondrous cross was sung, followed by recitations from the Quran and the Guru Granth Sahib and the performance of Hindu devotional songs. This was no ordinary fast. It was designed to avert a catastrophe and to assert that no one had a right to say India belonged to only the majority community and the minority community can only remain there as the underdog. It was only after receiving an ironclad written declaration signed by leaders of all the major organizations to restore goodwill among communities in Delhi and beyond that Gandhi broke his fast on January 18th to the chanting and singing of Japanese, Muslim, Parsi, Christian and Hindu scriptures and hymns and the recitation of the ancient mantra, Om Asatoma Sadgamaya. Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, 
Mrittorma Amritangamaya. Lead me from untruth to truth, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. The final week of the Mahatma's life was rich with symbolism, redolent of India's unity. On January 23rd, 1948, Gandhiji was very glad to take note of Shubhasha's birthday, even though he generally did not remember such dates. Shubhash, according to the Mahatma, knew no provincialism nor communal differences and had in his brave army men and women drawn from all over India with distinction and evoked affection and loyalty which very few have been able to evoke. A lawyer friend had requested Gandhi for a good definition of Hinduism. He did not have any but suggested that Hinduism regarded all religions as worthy of all respect. Shubhash Bose, according to him, was such a Hindu, and so in memory of that great patriot, he called upon his countrymen to, quote, cleanse their hearts of all communal bitterness, unquote. Gandhian values have been reduced today, today to a superficial cleanliness campaign. The Gates Foundation has in its wisdom given an award to our Prime Minister in recognition of this cleanliness drive, which is laudable. Yet, even at this time, 8 million people in Kashmir remain under a communication lockdown, and nearly 2 million people in Assam are threatened with statelessness, without any guarantee for the cultural distinctness, distinctness of Assam and the Northeast being protected. The language of citizenship and illegal immigration is being used in India quite as much as the United States of America to mask vicious anti-minority prejudice. Fences with spikes that can pierce human flesh are what majoritarian leader, leaders like Donald Trump have been demanding. Gandhiji would have wanted a campaign to cleanse human hearts of bigotry and hatred. January 26th was Independence Day for Gandhiji's generation. Let us permit ourselves to hope, he said on that occasion, that though geographically and politically India is divided into two, at heart we shall ever be friends and brothers, helping and respecting one another and be one for the outside world. The next day he was taken inside the Sanctum Sanctorum of Chishti's Shrine in Mehrauli, where he was anguished to see the damage to the exquisite marble screens. He had come to make a pilgrimage, not a speech, and he simply urged Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs to never again listen to the voice of Satan and abandon the way of brotherliness and peace. On the morning of January 30th, 1948, Gandhiji did his Bengali writing exercise, even though he had other pressing work, such as drafting a new constitution for the Congress. The sound of the shots fired at the Mahatma that evening echoed across the length and breadth of this great land. A 17-year-old girl was attending an interregional and intercaste wedding of a Bengali bride and a Malayali groom in Calcutta that evening when she heard the stunning news that Gandhiji had been shot dead. A pall of gloom slowly descended on the gathering and the guests quietly departed. That 17-year-old girl, now my mother, 89 years old, writes in her memoir, returning home she heard the radio playing Tagore's song, Shomukhe Shanti Parabar, as the great soul began his journey across the ocean of peace. My paternal grandfather, Sharat Chandra Bose, loved English literature and Shakespeare as much as he had hated British rule. On receiving the heart-rending news that the Mahatma was no more, he remarked wistfully, when comes such another? He might have added, if ever another. India needs to learn the proper lessons today from that tragedy and martyrdom. The journey from 1942 to 1947 does have a lot to teach us, but we must not learn the wrong lessons. 
We need a new freedom struggle to wrest freedom from caste oppression, freedom from class exploitation, freedom from gender discrimination, and above all, freedom from majoritarian tyranny. Jai And then Assam and Gopinath Bhargava because it was the bigger Assam as Assam. And then Gandhi sent his message and he was not only conveying, he said in spirit I am with them, I will sit with them on a hunger strike. If the Indian government, if the Congress doesn't respond to them and the individual space or what the reason wants should be respected. So that is how, because of Gandhi's this uh, Support some good progress. Thank you, sir. Mm. Take it out, yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, there, there's a long history, you know. Uh, in fact, Shubhash Chandra Bose's Congress president had played a role in the installation of the Gopinath Bhardaloi ministry. And uh, that's why he didn't want it to sort of uh, give up office in 1939. And Gandhiji was trying to bring about a balance between the rights of provinces, the groups, and the federal center. Uh, you know, because he was trying to find a way to avert a partition of India along religious lines. Uh, I, I do hope that uh, you know uh, you will you know write about uh, the experience of uh, Assam uh, for people to know in the rest of India because you know that period, 14th to the 16th century, uh, was an era of these bhakti movements in practically all of the regions of India. And as I was listening to the song being performed, uh, you know about Kabir, uh, you know there were similar. Uh, disputations in Kashmir over Lal Dev, you know, <laughs> is, is she Hindu or Muslim? And I think she would have answered in the same vein as Kabir, you know. Gandhi's, what Gandhi thought as true changed from time to time, as you yourself uh, demonstrated, uh, said in that. The same capacity in a post truth era is also seen in uh, figures like Donald Trump who uh, changed what truth means to them and as Gandhi used it for unity and brotherhood, people like Trump use it for divisiveness, this mutability of truth. What I want to ask is uh, how do we decide if truth is mutable, that uh, it should be uh, utilized for unity or divisiveness? No, that is a, a very insightful question. In my view, you know, Gandhiji did accept that there was a certain inner core of truth uh, which was not mutable. Uh, you see, the difference between 
a position where you might say that you could have different interpretations of reality. This is something that as historians we have argued constantly that you know there they cannot necessarily be one interpretation of a, of a historical event or a historical process. Uh, that there could be contending interpretations but those are interpretations that are uh, based on the evaluation and sifting of evidence. Uh, now this position that there could be multiple interpretations is very different from what is being said in the post-truth era or the votaries of you know truth in the post-truth era that anything goes. That there need not be any basis in evidence for what you're going to claim. That is exactly what a Donald Trump has been, uh, has been doing. Now, I think one of the students quoted E. H. Carr uh, in introducing this colloquium. E. H. Carr had said that history is a dialogue between the present and the past. So your location in the present would mean that you would choose certain historical topics for analysis, that your interpretations would to some extent be colored by your own position in sort of time and space. So let us make a distinction between uh, accepting that there could be different interpretations of, of reality and that's also quite important in thinking about nationalism that no one has a monopoly to decide who is a nationalist or what ought to be the proper definition of, of the nation. But that is very different from, you know, post-truth, which is, which is uh, just a complete fabrication with absolutely no reference to the evidence at hand. Faisal is a very interesting thinker, but he is a contrarian thinker. Uh, therefore, um, he, I think, revels in taking intellectual positions uh, that are plainly contrarian. So, you know, that is why you, you might find in some of his writings, you know, Gandhian thought and Gandhian values uh, being uh, entwined in a symbiotic relationship with violence or the, or the opposite and Osama bin Laden is shown of his you know, violent persona and thought. So in short, I don't agree with uh, either uh, you know, with Faisal's uh, interpretations of either Mahatma Gandhi or Muhammad Ali Jinnah. I think both interpretations are flawed and that is because you know as a historian he does not take archival evidence seriously. Uh, you know if you want to be a historian uh, you cannot just be somebody who is a thinker who on the face of it is philosophizing about big issues such as violence or non-violence non or truth and non-truth. So uh, I, I'm not persuaded by, by, uh, by, by Faisal Devji and you will see that um, in some of my writings I have a 
completely different interpretation of Gandhiji's writings in Young India from what Faisal Dev Ji conjures up. of Gandhi's complete support for a united Bengal, uh, repeatedly in the month of, uh, in the summer of 1947. Do you have very clear archival records and evidences of correspondence of, between Gandhi and Shamaprasad Mukherjee on this matter, on the united Bengal? Uh, no, there, there is correspondence between uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Sharad Chandra Bose, and there are records of his uh, conversations in Shodhpur between 9th May and 13th May uh, with Hossein Shahid Surawarti Abul Hashim and also on May 13th as I mentioned with Shama Prashad Mukherjee. He initially supported Sharad Bose's plan but in June he did make a statement saying that he had been taken to task for supporting you know Sharad Bose and basically what happened was that uh, you know there's actually a lot of documentary evidence because a British member of parliament, George Catlin, <coughs> Shirley Williams' father, was staying at one Woodburn Park, Sharad Bose's residence. And after a lot of uh, back and forth between Sharad Bose and Gandhi, who had gone to Patna after Calcutta, and Gandhi made some suggestions, the entire United Bengal plan was revised and refined. And the final version was taken by George Catlin to Mountbatten. And Mountbatten then took it to London, and as late as the 28th of May, he actually recorded two alternative broadcasts, Broadcast A and Broadcast B. According to Broadcast A, Bengal and Punjab and Bengal were to be <coughs> partitioned. But according to Broadcast B, the Hindu and Muslim leaders of Bengal had come to an agreement, and therefore there would not be a partition in Bengal. As soon as he came back from London <coughs> on the 30th of May, Nehru and Patel vetoed the Bengali exception. They felt that this would mean giving provinces you know, too many rights, that there may be other provinces which may demand more autonomy. But the converse of that would, would, would have been that if the Bengali exception had been granted, a Northwest Frontier Province exception might have also been considered because Abdul Ghaffar Khan there, you know, there was a Congress government in Northwest Frontier Province at that time. And Abdul Ghaffar Khan said in so many words that, you know, he and his followers, the Khudai Khidmatkar, had been thrown to the, to the wolves. So, <coughs> in order to get a very strong center, the then leaders of the Congress, both Nehru and Patel, decided to veto this and therefore broadcast A went on the air on June 3rd. That was the partition plan. So you have to accept, and there is documentary evidence for it, that even as late as May 28th, preservation of the unity of Bengal was still possible. Okay. And we sometimes simply think of religion as determining, you know, what was going on in 1947 and the ultimate outcome of partition. But we sometimes forget that the center region dynamic was also a very important one. Uh, there were some who were at the leadership levels of the Congress at that moment who wanted a strong center. While if you look at the political thought of most of the anti-colonial figures in the first half of the 20th century, they always felt that Indian unity had always been of a federal type. And therefore, one had to create an Indian union from below, rather than simply taking over the strong center, you know, crafted by, by the British Raj. So that is something that we need to bear in mind. And, and finally, I think we have to make a distinction between religion as faith and religion as identity. Because, you know, Gandhi, you know, was somebody who believed in religion as faith, you know, and that would contribute to, you know, an honorable conduct of politics. 
But there were others who simply looked at religion as demarcators of identity and marking others for, preju for prejudice and bigotry. Um, and that's why I think it's very important in today's India to not just reclaim nationalism from the chauvinists, but also uh, to recover the domain of religion from the religious leaders. Uh, look, uh, <clears throat> you know, as uh, students, scholars, uh, historians, we should uh, always be, you know, prepared to take a critical perspect perspective on not just Gandhi, but uh, on all of our, you know, iconic political leaders. And I think that there are legitimate uh, criticisms that can be made of, you know, Mahatma Gandhi's various positions on caste and so forth. And uh, certainly uh, B.R. Ambedkar uh, thought that Gandhiji had a very, you know, patronizing view towards those he called, you know, Harijans, you know, people of God, children of God. And that's a critique that we must, uh, you know, take seriously. Similarly, um, I think, um, you know, there is a legitimate criticism that one can have that uh, in his early life, uh, Gandhiji did not uh, include Africans in his, you know, struggle uh, in uh, South Africa. And there are some statements uh, which would appear from the perspective of the early 21st century to be very prejudiced towards Africans. So that is a criticism again which we must be prepared to accept. But I think uh, Nelson Mandela, you know, in some ways, you know, took the correct position uh, when uh, he basically said that some of those statements were made at a time before, you know, Gandhi emerged as the Mahatma. So the preeminent leader of Africa of the late 20th uh, century was prepared to be generous in, you know, accepting Gandhi's great contributions. Uh, without necessarily sweeping under the carpet uh, some of the legitimate criticisms that could be made. The other point to remember about Mahatma Gandhi, that he was constantly changing with the times. He did not actually stick to one position if he could be persuaded otherwise. And even in the course of my lecture, I pointed out that, you know, he was opposed to interdining, intermarriage, even in the early 1920s, even though he could be quite witty about saying that if my bigotry, you know, if, if, if my, uh, you know, my self-denial can be named bigotry and so forth. But, you know, in the 1940s, his position had changed. So that, I think, is something, you know, very important to remember about Gandhi. And if I did not highlight the possible criticisms that we could have of Gandhi today. It's because, you know, in this colloquium, we are also trying to draw from Gandhi's life and teachings, and his life was his message, as he, as he put it, what we can learn in confronting the gigantic crisis that has engulfed our national life today. And in that context, I felt that the way in which, you know, Gandhiji stood for the pursuit of truth and the way in which he forged unity among the different religious communities of India 
the way in which he believed that, that as a Sanatani Hindu, he could actually also be identified as a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim. All that, I felt, is very important uh, in the contemporary uh, context.